Welcome back to our series, Acts and Us, a study of the book of Acts. Now, we are in the later chapters of Acts, and many of these chapters, several of them in a row, we see Paul standing trial. Initially, he's back in Jerusalem and he's experiencing persecution from Jews, particularly Jews that came from the area of Galatia, we call it Asia Minor, and they came with accusations, stirring up the Jews in Jerusalem, where he's at now, against him. And it was such a riot that the Romans interfered. They, For his own safety, they brought Paul out of the riot and were about to interrogate him. And the way they do it is they stretch him out and flog him. But that's illegal to do to Paul because he's a Roman citizen. He deserves the right to a trial. And the commander was afraid because he had already started this process. So pick it back up into a couple verses in our previous chapter, Acts 22, 29, and 30. Listen to this. The commander was so afraid after he found out he was a Roman because he had bound him, the next day he wanted to know for certain why he was accused by the Jews. He released him from his bonds and commanded the chief priests and their council to appear and brought Paul down and set them before him. So he decided he really needed to give Paul a fair trial, bring accusation against him, find out who is accusing him and why. And that's where Acts 23 begins. Acts 23. Then Paul, looking earnestly at the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. And then Paul said, God will strike you, you whitewashed tomb, whitewashed wall, for you will sit in judgment of me according to the law, and do, and do you command me to be struck contrary to the law? And those who stood by said, Do you revile God's high priest? All right, see what happens here. Paul just spoke for himself in his own defense, and the high priest told someone standing by Paul to strike him on the mouth. Otherwise, in other words, probably punch him in the mouth. And, you know, Paul responded, of course, to the high priest. Now, he didn't know he was the high priest at the time, but, you know, really accused him. You whitewashed wall, you sit in judgment of me according to the law, and you command me to be struck contrary to the law? So he really kind of, you know, attacked the high priest. Now, the high priest who ordered him to be struck was Ananias ben Nadebus, and he was a high priest during the Second Temple period. Um, he was the high priest for a longer period of time, longer than anybody, since uh, Joseph Caiaphas. And you know, the name Caiaphas, that was the high priest during the time of Jesus' crucifixion, years prior. It probably could be close to 20, 30 years, maybe, at the most. So Paul was unaware that he was a high priest. He didn't probably shouldn't have said what he did. Let's pick it up in verse 5. Then Paul said, I did not know, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler or your people. But when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, concerning the hope and the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged. And when he said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. See, for the, Pharise the Sadducees say there's no resurrection, no angels, no spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. And then there arose a loud outcry, and the scribes of the Pharisees' party arose and protested, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. Isn't this interesting? All through the Gospels, we see the Pharisees as the nemesis of the believers, particularly Jesus and the apostles. Now here, Paul is brought on trial uh, by the Pharisees and the Sadducees, but he detects that the Pharisees and the Sadducees have, have completely opposite opinions about what Paul is being brought to trial. See, Paul is basically being brought to trial because he said Jesus spoke to him. Well, if Jesus spoke to him, that means Jesus is still alive. And if Jesus is still alive, that means there is, you know, there is a spirit world. There are angels. There are spirits. There is a resurrection of the dead that's possible. And only one half of the accusing body believes that. And it's the Pharisees to which Paul identifies with. Paul's a Pharisee, a son of a Pharisee, comes from a Pharisee family. But the Sadducees were on the other side. They don't believe in anything. I know it sounds ridiculous, but they don't believe in spirit world, the resurrection, afterlife, angels. They don't believe in any of that. And so Paul recognizes the rift between these two groups that were accusing him, and he strategically exploited it. You know, he strategically 
uh, clarified that division and brought that division that these uh, this opposing opinion to prominence reminding that he, he was once himself a Pharisee he believes in the afterlife he believes in angels he believes in the resurrection he believes in spirits this is something the Sadducees vehemently disagree with verse 10 now when there arose a great dissension the commander fearing lest Paul be pulled to pieces by them commanded the soldiers go down take him by force uh, take from among him them and bring him to the barracks so Paul is brought into protective custody. He's protected, but he's not free to go because the Romans knew that he may be murdered by the angry mob if they let him walk the streets. So he has to stay in their barracks. Verse 11, But the following night the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. All right, remember, much of the passion and conviction behind Paul's beliefs is the fact that he witnessed Jesus alive. He believed Jesus spoke to him on the road to Damascus. That Jesus spoke to him. The Lord spoke to him. Different incidents through the book of Acts. And we see it. The Lord had been continually checking in or speaking or directing Paul throughout this whole time. And here he tells him, be of good cheer because you're going to Rome. <laughs> And as we read on the book of Acts, you'll see it ends. The whole book ends. Sorry to be a spoiler, but it ends with Paul being a witness in Rome. Verse 12. And when it was day, some of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under an oath, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. Now there were more than 40 who had formed this conspiracy. They came to the chief priests and elders and said, We have bound ourselves under a great oath, that we will eat nothing until we have killed Paul. Now you, therefore, together with the council, suggest to the commander that he be brought down to you tomorrow, as though you were going to make some further inquiries concerning him. But we are ready to kill him before he comes near. So when Paul's sister's son, his nephew, heard of their ambush, he went and entered the barracks and told Paul. And then Paul called one of the centurions to him and said, Take this young man to the commander, for he has something to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the commander and said, Paul, the prisoner, called me to him and asked me to bring this young man to you. He has something to say to you. Then the commander took him by the hand, went aside and asked privately, what is that you have to tell me? And he said, the Jews have agreed to ask that you bring Paul down to the council tomorrow as though they were going to inquire more fully about him. But do not yield to them, for more than 40 of them lie in wait for him, men who have bound themselves by an oath that they will neither eat nor drink until they have killed him. And now that, you are, now that they are ready, waiting for the promise from you. So the commander let the young man depart and commanded him, tell no one that you have revealed these things to me. All right, interesting plot. We see a subplot forming. This is a conspiracy. These are assassins, more than 40, who have taken an oath that they will not eat nor drink until they have killed Paul. And they're going to do it by way of ambush. They're trying to get this conspiracy, get the, the council to call Paul in for more questioning. But before he even gets there, they're going to kill him. So, fortunately, Paul had family in Jerusalem. It's interesting that Paul has family in Jerusalem because he's not really from Jerusalem. He grew up there as a rabbinical student, as a Pharisaical student, Pharisee under Gamaliel. But uh, he was born and raised over 500 miles away, north in a town called Tarsus in Cilicia. Um, but he's got family here. He, at least he's got a sister uh, who has a son, his nephew, and probably a, a husband. That would be proper. So they're living in Jerusalem here. And probably the sister's husband has something to do with the temple or the high priest or something. Because his son, this nephew, had proximity to this conversation that he overheard with the chief priests and, and elders. And this young man may have saved Paul from the attack of the assassins by telling the commander about it. Although, I have to say, the Lord probably would not have allowed Paul to die at the hands of the assassins because the Lord had already told Paul he's going to Rome. Um, but this is the mechanism that the Lord used to get Paul from Jerusalem to Rome. The level of threat on, on Paul's life was so high in Jerusalem that the Romans themselves 
decided to send Paul to Caesarea with oh, nearly 300 armed men, horses and spearmen. You'll see, it says here in verse 23, he called for two centurions saying, prepare 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at the third hour of the night and provide mounts to set Paul on and bring him safely to the Felix, to Felix the governor. So this threat was so serious. Here's Paul leaving in the middle of the night with an entire army going, really, they say going down, but it's really northwest towards Caesarea on the coastline. And he sent them with this letter. And here's the letter he wrote. So bear in mind, this is the Roman commander appealing to his hierarchy, really the Roman governor in uh, Caesarea, named after Caesar. Uh, it's, you know, the, the place where there's a Herodian fortress and all these things. Um, and he sends this letter. He wrote a letter in the following manner, in verse 25, verse 26. Claudius Lysias, to the most excellent governor Felix, greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them. Coming with the troops, I rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman. And when I wanted to, to know the reason they accused him, I brought him before their council. I found that he was being accused concerning questions of their law, but had nothing charged against him deserving death or change. And when I was told that the Jews lay in wait for the man, I sent him immediately to you and also commanded his accusers to state before you the charges against him. Farewell. Okay. So this is a little bit of a smoke and mirror dog and pony show. I mean, Paul probably didn't need this much medical uh, military detail to get to Caesarea, but this Roman commander knew that he publicly took a Roman citizen, Paul, had him jailed in chains, no trial, stretched him out, was about to flog him and then realized he was a Roman citizen. And um, he probably couldn't, could have gotten a lot of trouble for that. Uh, that's in Acts 22, 29. He says, the commander was afraid when he found out he was a Paul, that, he, that Paul was a Roman citizen because he had bound him. So this is a little bit of a cover-up to atone for this illegal treatment of Paul. Uh, he sends him with all this proper treatment, you know, proper protection, and hopefully his higher-ups, Felix, the governor, would overlook that small incident that took place in Acts 22. Verse 31 says this, Then the soldiers, as they were commanded, took Paul and brought him by, the, by night into Antipatris. The next day they left the horsemen to go on with him and return to the barracks. When they came to Caesarea and had delivered the letter to the governor, they also presented Paul to him. And when the governor had read it, he asked the, that what province he was from. And when he, he understood he was from Cilicia, he said, I will hear you when your accusers have come. And he commanded him to be kept in Herod's Praetorium. That's how the chapter ends. So, gets to Caesarea, which is Caesarea Maritime, or Maritime, however you want to say it, up on the coast. Paul's in custody. Felix recognizes that, yes, this guy's a Roman citizen. He deserves a fair trial. We're not going to do anything about it until those who are accused him come and we'll give him a fair trial to figure out what all this is about. And really, the next couple chapters are dedicated to that trial. And uh, so Paul's being kept safe. He's living in this fortified city by the sea, even though he's not free to leave, so he's still in custody. Uh, Felix delays this official trial because he wants some bribe money from this large constituency of people that, that follow Paul, the way, they call it. Uh, so he keeps him there for two years. Two years, Paul is in this coastal fortress while he's, being, while he's awaiting trial. All right, so what's happening here? From the moment Paul arrived in Jerusalem, it's been chaos. Crowds rioting against him. Romans shackling him, about to beat him with whips. Uh, high priests punching, having him punched in the mouth. Um, Roman barracks, you know, uh, him brought to barracks to protect him. Forty assassins pledged to a hunger strike until they kill him. All this stuff is going on. And, and Paul is still not out of the woods because he knows that trial awaits him. And he's not really kind of counting on a fair trial. It's either the Romans have custody of, him, custody of his fate or the Jews have custody of his fate. Jews that want to kill him and Romans that are killing Jews you know, by the droves in this first century. So things do not look good. It would have been very easy 
for Paul to succumb to fear, thinking there's no way he's going to get out of this thing alive, except for that promise that the, when the Lord stood by him at night, just a few verses ago, Acts 23, 11, but the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must bear witness at Rome. Be of good cheer, he said. All this stuff's going around that I just described, and the Lord shows up at night and says, hey, be happy. Don't worry. Don't worry. Be happy. And he didn't just say, don't worry. He didn't even say that. He didn't even say, do not be afraid. He said, be of good cheer. I'm not sure I would be able to be cheerful under such circumstances. You have the Jews forming an alliance to try to kill you. You have Romans who won't let you out of their custody. You're still basically in chains. And the Lord telling you, be of good cheer. <laughs> but you see, Paul had been trusting the word of the Lord this whole journey. He's been through some very harsh trials and persecu persecutions, as you know, during this whole second half of Acts since he appeared as Saul of Tarsus. And he knew that these kinds of trials and tribulations and bonds and shackles were part of the plan. He knew it back in Miletus. He knew it back when he was in this beautiful um, you know, village on the coast, Miletus, on the Aegean Sea, hanging out with all his friends in Acts 20. That's why he says in Acts 20, 24, 22 and 24, and now compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my, wife, my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying the good news of God's grace. So he said, yeah, I know when I get to Jerusalem, I'm going to be bound. I'm going to be in prison. There's going to be trials. There's going to be hardships. But that doesn't matter because that's what I need to do to do the th very thing I'm compelled to do, and that's finish the race and the task of testifying the good news, the gospel of Jesus. So the same spirit that told him that prison and hardships await in Jerusalem is now telling him, be of good cheer because you're going to Rome. So he knew he wasn't going to die here in Caesarea or back in Jerusalem. He didn't fear, and he was able to have cheerful confidence, cheerful confidence that he could trust the Lord despite circumstances, that he could endure hardships because he knew that God had a specific plan for him on every step of his journey. And that plan is not going to be halted or altered by any adversary that he faced. That's Acts. What about us? That's our title for our series is Acts and Us. So we see what's, what's happening with Paul, what he's going through. How can that apply to us? How are we with that? How do we respond when the road gets really rough and things seem hopeless? Do you sometimes find it hard to have confidence that the right outcomes are going to take place in your life when you're facing such a wave of adversity? Do you sometimes worry that someone or something's going to stop God's plan for you, stop God's purposes from taking place, stop God's promises from being fulfilled in your life? When trials and tribulations come, do you find yourself fearful and discouraged and worried and overcome with anxiety and doubt? You know, the truth is, we all do from time to time. We all do. The best of the believers I know experience that from time to time. And that's why it's so important to meditate on and trust in God's word. God's word. Because those days will come. Jesus told us there'd be days like this. Jesus himself told us in John 16, These things I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But, just like he told Paul, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Now, personally, I know that my faith gets put to the test when I'm forced to trust God for provision when I don't even see where it's going to come from. I can't visually see it, but I have to trust God that it will be there. When we first started the church, I left a job where I had a steady income for 12 straight years and promised income to continue. But I felt the Lord telling me to go out and start a, a church from scratch with nothing and only a half a year's provision for this church. And if it didn't work, I would not be able to pay my bills and provide for my family. 
But I knew it was God's will for my life and our family's life, and I knew we just needed to move forward. And in times of doubt, I needed to remind myself of that calling that I was moving towards. I often quoted Chuck Smith, whose famous quote was, where God guides, God provides. Well, I knew God was guiding, so I knew that God would provide. I hung on to my favorite verse in Philippians. It says this in Philippians 4.19, and my God will supply all your need according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And as hard as it is sometimes to believe these types of words, we have to admit that each of us know, and we found out from time to time, again and again in our lives, that his word is always faithful and that he never fails. I looked at some other scriptures for these reinforcements. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him amen to the glory of God through us. Back in Joshua, when they were facing these kinds of doubts and, and indecisions, Joshua 21.45, not one of all of the Lord's promises to Israel failed. Everyone was fulfilled. We know that in our lives. But what about those times where we, like Paul, are asked to do something that seems to be beyond our faith ability? He asks you to go somewhere or do something that's difficult or dangerous, or he puts your faith to the test, to a measure that you don't think you could really hold up. It's those times that we need to trust him and his strength, his wisdom, his providence, and not our own abilities. Rely on his word and his promises. His word and his promises. Think about Abraham. Abraham is always the example of faith, right? His faith you know, was, was reckoned to him as righteousness, his faith. Abraham was a wealthy man. He was living comfortably with his family in a safe place when God called him out and told him to pack up everyone and everything and move to a land you don't know. It's in, you know, it's the lech lecha, is, the, is the, uh, the, the Hebrew phrase of go ye out to a land that you don't know. But this is an act of faith on Abraham's part. And he's listed in the hall of faith. Hebrews 11 is the hall of faith. Many great men of faith are listed here and women. Um, and he's listed twice. And first one is in Hebrews 11, 8. He says, by faith, Abraham when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went. And even though he did not know where he was going, by faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. You see, God promised him and said, go, and Abraham said, okay, because if you promise me, that means if I step into this thing, which seems, you know, maybe uh, ill-advised by my, my advisors to go to a place I don't know, but you promised me, so I'm going to go. And then years later, his faith was put to the test again, although turned up a notch, several notches. Uh, he had settled in the promised land. God had provided. Now he has land. He has flocks. He has peace with his his neighbors and, and his enemies. He has a loving family. He has the child of the promise, Isaac, who the promise would be uh, to go through for generations, his descendants. He's got all this. But then God asks him to do the unthinkable, to take that child of the promise, this son with who, to whom or through whom your descendancy will go and bless all the peoples of the world, take him and sacrifice him on Mount Moriah, this is in Genesis 22, take the son whom you love, which by the way is the first time love, the word, appears in the Bible, and sacrifice him on Mount Moriah. Wow, what a test. How could he even think of doing that? I'm sure if it was me, I would have questioned it to no end. That if, is this really God? It can't be God because this is my son. I'm not going to kill my son. And beyond, beside that, this is the one who is going to live to, to bear children and grandchildren. And that's going to become the nation of Israel. But he had faith in God. He had faith that God would provide. So he did it. 
He knew that God's promise was that Isaac is going to have children and grandchildren. So he went and just trusted God. He had faith in God and packed him up and went up there with the, uh, the, the, the knife and the bundle of, uh, of firewood. And he was about to, to do this thing. But the Lord wouldn't let him. And you know how the story goes. The Lord would not let him go through with it. But I believe that Abraham was willing to go through with it because of this. And listen to this. I believe that Abraham thought to himself that if he does go and kill Isaac, the Lord would pop him back to life again. That he, if, if Abraham went through with that sacrifice and killed his son, that the Lord would resurrect his, his son and continue. Because the promise was for Isaac, the child of the promise, and nothing that Abraham did would be able to stop that promise. The reason I say that is because Hebrews eleven seventeen tells us this. It says in, in 17, By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to them, It is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Verse 19, Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the death. So, so Abraham reasoned with himself, there's nothing I can do to kill him or end the promise that's resting upon Isaac. So he went through with obedience and then obviously God stopped him. See, here's how we have to approach God's will and his promises. We need to learn to know what God's will is in our life. Our big deals, our big matters, our small matters. Sometimes it takes time and prayer to detect his leading and calling in our lives, but we must seek him for that. It's not okay just to be ignorant of God's plan. You know, you need to seek God, understand what the will of God is for your life. Listen, he may not speak to you like he spoke to Paul, like he spoke to Abraham, but I found it's pretty clear to learn to know and detect the voice of God through the Word, through the Holy Spirit, and to Him to give you an indication of what you're to do. And when He does, just do it. And if He promises you something, believe that His promise will come about. We must trust God's promises more than we trust circumstances. That's what we saw in Abraham, and that's what we're seeing in Acts with Paul. He's trusting God's promises more than he's trusting circumstances. Circumstances would indicate for Paul back here in Acts 23 that his life is probably going to end either in Jerusalem or in Caesarea. Promise, God's promise says, you're going to be my witness in Rome. Which one would he trust? He trusted God's promise because his promises are faithful. His promises are true. His promises are yes and amen. 2 Corinthians 1.20 again. For all the promises of God in him are yes and in him amen to the glory of God through us. Friends, we have no reason to doubt God. What he says is true. Be confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. God bless you.